Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. This is episode 26, and I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Gallimimus bulletus, as well as a bunch of dinosaur news. First in the news, there's an exciting dinosaur discovery in Washington State in the U.S., it's not a new dinosaur that makes it exciting. It's exciting because it's the first dinosaur that's ever been found in the state of Washington. And some scientists are saying that it might be the last U.S. state to have a dinosaur ever discovered in it. That's because a lot of the states were underwater during the time of dinosaurs. One other state, Hawaii, wasn't even formed for another 60 million years or so. And... Most of the northeast was scraped up by glaciers, which removed a lot of the dinosaur-era material. Washington might be the last state. It's a very interesting-looking little bone fragment. It's only about a third of a femur, but even though it's only a third of a femur, it's more than a foot long and over a half a foot wide. It's kind of a triangular piece. So when the Burke Museum got this fossil, it sat in the queue for a little while because it didn't look like anything particularly interesting and possibly not anything that they could even identify. It was still partly attached to a rock at that point, as bones often are when they're transported to museums, and that turned out to be the reason why they couldn't tell at all what it was. When they looked closely at it and they removed that rock and looked at the backside of it, they found a characteristic curve to the bone that indicated that it was probably the femur of an animal, or at least a large animal that had a big muscle attachment point. So when they published their findings in the PLOS One journal, they talk about how they went from museum to museum with this fragment and compared it to existing bones. Oh, another key reason they could tell it was a dinosaur bone was because it was actually hollow, or at least partially hollow, which is a big sign that it's a dinosaur bone and not some other large animal from the time period, because as we know, birds have hollow bones, and that originally happened in dinosaurs. So that's a big clue. That it was a big bone. They could tell it had a big muscle. <laughs> so they started looking at theropods and eventually found a match, or at least found a bone that was very similar, confirming that it did look like it was from a large theropod, possibly a T-Rex, given that it's in the western U.S. Another very interesting article that was published was published in the journal Evolution by lead author Bart Anjan Buller, and specifically what they were doing was looking at the beaks of different species and trying to figure out how exactly they related. Specifically, their article is titled, A Molecular Mechanism for the Origin of a Key Evolutionary Innovation, the Bird Beak and Palate, revealed by an integrative approach to major transitions in vertebrate history, which is quite a mouthful. But it reminds me a little bit of the study that looked at all the different sauropods and discovered that Brontosaurus was probably back in its own genera. They have an interesting graphic where they look at all the different animals with beaks that are closely related, including reptiles, crocodiles, and birds. And they really wanted to distinguish in the developmental process how they differentiated between the beaks and the snouts and having teeth and not having teeth and all that kind of stuff. It looks like their focus was more on whether or not the animal developed a more snout-shaped mouth or if it had a beak-shaped, you know, pointy mouth. But they didn't look into the whole teeth and not teeth piece, which seems like a big part of it to me. So in this study, they took a chicken embryo and they basically tried to make it look as much like a dinosaur as they could by expressing different genes at varying amounts than what a chicken would normally have. So if you look at a fetal crocodile versus a chicken, at very early developmental stages, they look pretty much the same. And if you've ever seen mammals compared to marsupials and fish and sharks and everything, they all look pretty similar as early embryos. But as they develop, you start to see more and more differentiation. And the way scientists have figured out that that works is different proteins and different genes get expressed during the developmental process. 
And if you can find chemicals or proteins that impact that developmental process, you can kind of skew the developmental growth in different directions, or you can make something bigger, or you can make it not develop completely in one place or, you know, focus on another development. And a lot of disorders and birth defects in humans can be characterized on missing certain proteins during the developmental process, which causes a different problem, and it also can cause cancer and things like that. So actually, the original findings about how this whole process worked was in research into how cancer happened. So in case you're interested in all the nitty-gritty details, I read through the whole peer-reviewed journal article to get some of the fun <laughs> fun bits out of it, and it looks like they broke down the chicken beak development into two stages. They talk about in the beginning, there's this FGF8 protein, which stands for fibroblast growth factor 8, and that makes the structure of collagen and other parts of an animal. So that's actually what's forming the beak at the early stages. And they cloned some of that from an emu and then identified the inhibitor that would prevent too much of that from happening and then between the inhibitor and adding more of the protein you can adjust how much development this chicken is going to have in the early stages and then later on they use something called lef1 which is lymphoid enhancer binding factor one which basically fuses the two halves of the beak into one solid structure obviously a beak doesn't work if it's two halves but if you look at say a t-rex skull you'll see that the two halves of its snout aren't completely fused which is just how a crocodile is too so between those two proteins they managed to make these chicken embryos end up with a more rounded snout that looks a lot more like a velociraptor or a small theropod rather than looking like a chicken they didn't actually hatch these embryos so there aren't little baby weird hybrid chicken dinosaurs running around and there's a little bit of an ethical dilemma there but they did manage to prove that you can use the same genes in modern birds beaks to make more of a snout shape just like the old dinosaurs had and what crocodiles exhibit too so it's pretty fascinating and it's a a big step towards what i think the real way you could make a jurassic park type situation (laughs) would be which is not finding DNA in some mosquito like they do in the movie, you probably have to express genes in modern birds and kind of work your way backwards from a modern bird using the genetic material that's still there rather than trying to come up with genetic material that's long extinct. So that news story kind of fits into our next one, which is there was uh, another sort of leak slash, you know, hint at what's going to be in Jurassic World. And in this case, they're talking about how Jurassic World describes their creation of dinosaurs versus how they did in Jurassic Park. So if you remember in Jurassic Park, they had the amber, they extracted the blood out of the mosquito that was trapped in the amber that had dinosaur DNA in it. And then they shoved in some frog DNA to fill in the missing pieces, apparently. And voila, you have a dinosaur. Apparently in real life, DNA doesn't last nearly long enough. It would decay and you wouldn't or end up with that even if it's trapped in amber it doesn't matter but (laughs) in any event that's what they said happened in jurassic park in jurassic world what they're saying they do is they use this thing called iron chelators to find this dna from back in the day and that's supposedly a better way to find dna and that way you don't need the frog dna anymore i just thought it was funny when i read that because i knew i had heard of chelators before And it turns out that's just the scientific term for metals attracting. And the main way that it's used is if you accidentally eat a poisonous metal, you can go to the hospital and what they'll do is they'll use chelators to get a different metal to attract the poisonous metal that's in your body and it'll pull it out of your body. And some people say that's removing the toxins. So it's becoming this popular pseudoscience focal Point, but that's a whole other story. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how Jurassic World describes their chelators and how that, what that has to do with 
dinosaur DNA, but I'll give them the creative license there because otherwise they don't have any dinosaurs to play with in the movie. Also, speaking of creative license in Jurassic World, Everything Dinosaur, which is a company in the UK, they have a daily blog where they talk about different dinosaurs and news and other things. They have an interesting speculation on Indominus Rex, the new species of dinosaur that's going to be introduced in Jurassic World. So Indominus Rex is supposedly made up from a variety of theropods and is supposed to be bigger than T-Rex. So what Everything Dinosaur, the group behind the blog, did was project the growth rate because if we go by what the movie says, InGen came up with the idea of Indominus Rex only in 2012. So the dinosaur would only be three years old. And based on that and the fact that it's bigger than T-Rex, the Everything Dinosaur team worked out that Indominus Rex would grow at an incredibly fast rate. So for example, if it and a T-Rex were hatched at the same time, at one year they'd be around the same size. But when Indominus Rex was only two years old, it would be the size of a T-Rex at seven years old, and Indominus Rex at three years old would be the size of a T-Rex at 20 years old. Of course, this is all very speculative. Indominus Rex is a made-up dinosaur, and Jurassic World is a fictitious world. But it's kind of fun to look at these tidbits and theorize about what we'll see in the movie on June 12th. And as we always feel the need to mention... (laughs) There's another dinosaur game about to be launched, at least partially launched. It's by a small game developer called Studio Wildcard, and the game's called Ark Survival Evolved. It drops you into a world as a naked man or woman, not man and woman like Naked and Afraid, but (laughs) you're in a crazy, you know, survival mode, and there's dinosaurs all over the place. And you just have to survive. And apparently, it's a big open world concept game. And you can either try to conquer the dinosaurs and hunt them and everything, or you can domesticate them and ride them around as the early video shows, which seems totally awesome. Um, It's supposed to launch for early access, which means that the game is not finished at all but you can play it and find bugs and tell the developer about them and all that kind of stuff on June 2nd of this year, but it's not going to be fully released until June of next year. So I'm going to try to get on that early access because I want to play it really bad (laughs) and see how they're going to handle all these dinosaurs and domesticating them and everything. Um, So if I can get on there, I'll definitely mention it and how fun it is or not fun. Hopefully it's fun. Hopefully you can domesticate them and don't just have to hunt them all the time like most dinosaur games go. So speaking of hunting dinosaurs, the channel Munchies on Vice.com interviewed Bart on John Buller, who, if you remember from earlier, is the man who was the lead author on the study with the chicken snout slash beak. <laughs> and they wanted to ask him about what he thought dinosaurs tasted like. And I think they may have misinterpreted the study a little bit, thinking that he was reverse engineering a dinosaur, which he wasn't really, but we already talked about that. Um, (laughs) But he basically goes through and talks about how birds and modern reptiles both are full of what are known as fast twitch fibers in the muscle, and it's the type of muscle that's designed for really quick and powerful bursts of energy, but it's not good for sustained energy. So mammals have red meat, basically, and it's full of a lot of oxygen, and it's good for aerobic activity. So we can chase something for a really long period of time. If you think about those, you know, cheetahs chasing a gazelle for three, four minutes down the savanna kind of thing, whereas an alligator will lay there for a long period of time and then a gazelle walks up to drink out of the water hole and it snatches it immediately. So the fast twitch is what you need for that quick snatch or if you're flying that quick huge burst of energy to push yourself off the ground. So apparently that gives birds and other animals with fast twitch fibers a distinctive taste, whereas things with red meat and the slow twitch fibers have a totally different taste. 
So when you boil it all down, the result is that a dinosaur probably tasted somewhere between a chicken and a crocodile. So I've actually eaten alligator when I visited New Orleans, and I thought it tasted a lot like chicken, maybe a little bit tougher. Yeah, so maybe it's splitting hair saying if it tastes more like chicken or more like a crocodilian. They also said that it might taste kind of like ostrich because I guess ostriches are one of the less evolved, still existing birds. So, yeah, we've both eaten ostrich, and it did taste kind of like chicken. It was a little bit gamier, though, so maybe you get that out of a dinosaur. I don't know. And they also talk a little bit in the article about whether or not eating meat affects the taste of an animal, and apparently predatory birds taste really bad. We always eat birds that, you know, are herbivores like chickens and quail and stuff. Apparently eating meat gives them kind of a sour taste, just animals in general. So maybe a T-Rex would be kind of bitter, but a sauropod would be delicious. <laughs> and then it appears there's another dinosaur that was discovered, not out in the field, but discovered to be a new species once the fossil was more closely analyzed. So in this case, the fossil comes from New Mexico, and it's a Sauronothelestis. The fossil was originally classified as a Sauronothelestis langostoni, which is a species of theropod dinosaur in the Dromaeosauridae family. It was discovered back in 1999 in New Mexico by paleontologist Robert Sullivan, but it's been analyzed recently by paleontologist Stephen Jasinski, and he noticed that there were enough differences between the type specimen of Langstoney and the one that Sullivan had discovered that it warranted calling the Sullivan specimen its own name. So congratulations to Sullivan. It's now called Sullivani, obviously named after him. If you're wondering what makes the two specimens different for Sullivan's specimen to get its own name, it's that the skull indicates that the Sullivani specimen had a larger olfactory bulb, which would have given it a much better sense of smell than the other Sauronthelestis species. If you want to find out more, the full article is in the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science Bulletin, but I couldn't find an online version of that for this recording. Recently, there was a fun question posed in the New York Times, and the question is, did dinosaurs peel or shed their skins? It's something I hadn't really thought of, but according to Mark A. Norrell, who's the chairman of the Division of Paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History, which Sabrina and I have mentioned is one of our favorite museums, yes, they definitely did. <laughs> but they probably didn't shed all at once, as a lot of people think of snakes doing basically said both birds and other reptiles like crocodiles shed kind of patches at a time and his description is if you've ever had a bad sunburn and you're peeling skin i know that's happened to me plenty of times <laughs> you lose big flakes of skin and that's basically the quantity a modern bird or crocodilian would have and considering that their closest common ancestor is the dinosaurs the best guess is that dinosaurs probably displayed that same amount of shedding. It makes me wonder how exactly that scales, though. If you have a, you know, 50-ton animal, does that mean that its skin is coming off in relative size? So you're getting, like, dinner plate-sized chunks of shedding, or are you getting just, like, little tiny pieces all the time, like it's just snowing around this thing? I don't know. But it would be pretty gross. <laughs> I guess it makes sense why there were so many bugs around back then, because you need something to clean up all that skin. Ugh. <laughs> One of the most fun pieces of news is there's a dinosaur triceratops costume that's on sale on Amazon by a company called Animal Planet. It's super cute. <laughs> it's, you know, three horns plus a big frill behind it, it straps to the dog's head. I don't think I've ever had a dog that would allow me to put this thing on its head, but if I did... I'd be really tempted to do it all the time <laughs> because it looks awesome. You should look it up on Amazon if you're interested or if you have a little puppy that would allow you to put this thing on its head. They do have other sizes for bigger dogs and smaller dogs. And they also have a little theropod one that has little arms and legs sticking out of it too. <laughs> so maybe keep that in mind for Halloween. 
a news story that's near and dear to my heart. The Milwaukee County Zoo is bringing back its animatronic dinosaurs. So I grew up in Milwaukee, and when I was a little kid, I saw these animatronic dinosaurs, or at least I saw animatronic dinosaurs there. And it was one of the things that really piqued my interest in dinosaurs. They seemed completely lifelike to me at the time, and I was so amazed by them. And now I'm looking at pictures of the ones that are going into the Milwaukee County Zoo, and they are some of the worst-looking animatronic dinosaurs that I've seen in a while. But they must be better than they were 20 years ago when I saw them. But nonetheless, I'm sure kids would love them, and it makes me second-guess everything I've said about all of these animatronic dinosaurs and how some of them look better than others, because obviously if you're a kid and you have a good imagination, these animatronic dinosaurs are awesome no matter where they are and how big they are and how accurate they are, because I was blown away by what must have been not that high-tech of animatronics. So if you're in Milwaukee, I would highly recommend it, because I loved it when I was a kid, so... It must be great. I think it cost $2.50 additional from the regular zoo price, so totally worth it if you have a kid. In more advanced animatronics, there's a new exhibit opening this Saturday, May 30th, in Vancouver, Canada. And it's called Ultimate Dinosaurs Meet a New Breed of Beast. From the picture on their website, you can see that it's the back of a Spinosaurus. And they talk about how they're going to have displays for... Dinosaurs from the Southern Hemisphere, specifically Africa and South America. So that makes me think there's probably going to be Gigantosaurus, Spinosaurus, and some of these other interesting but lesser known dinosaurs that we've talked about on our show before. If you're in Vancouver, I would definitely check it out. They say that they're going to use some augmented reality techniques to make them come to life, and I'd be very interested to see what that's like. Last but not least, there's a position that we stumbled on on the idealist.org for a Friday morning tour guide at Dinosaur Ridge. So if you have free time and you're in the Morrison, Colorado area, you might be able to snag a pretty cool job where you can be a tour guide and discuss paleontology and geology with students, which would be a pretty awesome job. So check it out if you're in the area. And that's all we have for news in this episode. Now for our dinosaur of the day, Gallimimus. Gallimimus was in the Jurassic Park original movie and may make an appearance in Jurassic World. Its name means chicken mimic. It was first found in the Gobi Desert in August 1963, but it wasn't named until 1972. The name Mimus comes from the fact that its vertebral arch of its front neck looks similar to that of a galliform. And a galliform is an order of birds that feed on the ground. It includes chickens, turkeys, and quails. There's only one species of Gallimimus, and the type species is Gallimimus bulatus. The species name comes from the Latin word bua, and one of those meanings refers to an amulet worn by ancient Roman boys as protection against evil spirits. So, the reason Gallimimus bulletus got the name bulletus is because it has an unusual capsule in the base of its skull. The holotype specimen has a partial skeleton, which includes the skull and lower jaws, and Rinchen Barsbold, who is part of the team that named Gallimimus, almost named a second species of Gallimimus called Mongoliensis, but decided later that it was instead an unknown ornithomimid. Gallimimus lived in Mongolia in the late Cretaceous, about 71 to 69 million years ago. It was found in the Namek Formation, which probably had a lot of diverse foods. There was also a stream and river channels, mud flats, and shallow lakes. Gallimimus looked like a big ostrich, but with claws and a tail, and if you've seen Jurassic Park then you you know, yes, it looks like a giant ostrich. <laughs> it's similar to other dinosaurs, such as Pelicomimus, Struthiomimus, and Ornithomimus, whose names respectively mean pelican mimic, ostrich mimic, and bird mimic. Gallimimus was 26 feet long, weighed about 500 pounds, and was bipedal. It had long legs, a long neck, and a long tail, and hollow bones, and it's unclear how fast it could run, though... If you go to the Jurassic World website where they talk about the different dinosaurs that are mentioned in the movies, it suggests that it could run 30 miles an hour. 
the hollow bones reduced its weight, so it didn't need as much energy to run fast, and it lived on an open, arid plain, so it would have been easy for it to run. It also had a tail to help it counterbalance, and it could probably make fast turns. Gallimimus had short arms compared to other dinosaurs in its family, and it had three clawed fingers in each hand and three clawed toes in each foot. It had a small head but a relatively large brain, and it had no teeth in its mouth. Again, like a giant ostrich, so more beak than teeth. There's been a lot of controversy over what Gallimimus ate. It may have had a beak, like a modern duck. This is based on a discovery in 2001 by Pete McAvicky, who is from the Field Museum in Chicago, found that the dinosaur had soft tissues in the skull, which showed traces of a beak along its jaw, and the beak was probably composed of keratin, which is the same thing that makes up your fingernails. It also had comb-like plates in the jaw, which is similar to the filter-feeding structure of a duck's bill, so a duck bill constrained food from water and sediment. This made some scientists think that Gallimimus was an herbivore, and you can also find these similar type of beaks in herbivores, sea turtles, and in Edmontosaurus. But some scientists also think that it may have used its beak to pick up plants or small animals, such as lizards, snakes, and mammals, although that would have been hard to swallow since they don't have any teeth. According to the Norwegian paleontologist Jorn Hurum, some of the bones in Gallimimus's beak and lower jaw were very thin, only a few millimeters, and the bottom of its beak may have been shaped like a shovel. Gallimimus had a rigid jaw, so it could really only open and close its mouth and not do much else. If it did eat meat, and if it hunted, it may have picked up the small animal and thrown it to the ground to kill it. It could have also stolen dinosaur eggs from nests. Or Gallimimus also had very flexible arms, so they could have used it to get fruit or catch and hold prey or dig dirt. So again, it's not really clear what Gallimimus ate. Gallimimus had eyes on the opposite sides of its head, which gave it a wide field of view. It could easily spot threats, but it didn't have binocular vision, so not really any depth perception, like other predators, which again shows, well, maybe it didn't eat meat. But since it probably was a fast runner, it has similar leg proportions to ostriches, it could have caught up to prey, or it could have used its long legs to run away from threats like Tarbosaurus. Gallimimus is part of the group Ornithomimosaurs, and it's one of the largest. Ornithomimosaurs is a group of theropods, and we've mentioned it in a few other episodes. It was one of the biggest Ornithomimosaurs, although maybe not the biggest. The biggest Ornithomimosaur may have been Dinochirus. We talked about Dinochirus in episode 10. Just to quickly go over Dinochirus, for a long time, all that was known about it was that it had giant hands. And then last year, a team published a study. They had found more bones and were able to figure out more details about this dinosaur. And it's a very large ornithomimid. And it was also incredibly strange looking. Like it had these giant hands and also possibly a hump back. So ornithomimids were one of the most common dinosaurs by the end of the Cretaceous, and there have been a lot of Gallimimus bones found from juveniles to adults. Juveniles may have had primitive downy feathers, although it's not clear if adults had the feathers because larger animals tend to need fewer feathers for insulation. Gallimimus was not that well known as a dinosaur until Jurassic Park came out in 1993, and in the movie, more than two dozen Gallimimus stampede and to create that scene, the crew filmed themselves pretending to run like Gallimimus to help them figure out how to animate the scene. And interestingly, in Jurassic Park, Gallimimus was the only dinosaur to be completely CGI. You might also be able to see them in Jurassic Park 3 as decomposing embryo. And then there's speculation that it might also appear in Jurassic World, but we'll see. Gallimimus also appeared in the Land Before Time movies, not in the original one. Their first scene in the Land Before Time 7 movie. <laughs> uh, in the movie, they're known as rainbow faces because they're portrayed as having striped beaks. Ornithomimids have, again, long arms, long necks, long legs, and they lived in Asia and North America in the late Cretaceous. 
Some species of ornithomimids may have been taller than T. rex, and ornithomimids often ate with gastroliths, which is when they swallow smooth stones to help them digest. And our fun fact of the day again comes from what seems to be our favorite paleontologist of the episode, <laughs> Bart Anjan Buller, and at this point I'm really hoping that I'm pronouncing that right since I've said it so many times. But during one of his interviews about his chicken-slash-dinosaur-beak slash snout project, he was quoted saying, there are between 10,000 and 20,000 species of birds alive today, which is at least twice as many as the total number of mammal species, and so in many ways it is still the age of dinosaurs. And I just love that quote because, you know, we talk about non-avian dinosaurs, but that means, hey, dinosaurs are still everywhere and there we're still outnumbered by them. <laughs> <laughs> at least by species so awesome and that wraps up this episode of i know dino thanks for listening and until next time Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.